I realized in the first two, three years that I spent at Intel that in doing that or getting to that level on for a chip is going to take a really long time. So ever since then, I think my pursuit or whenever I've moved uh, companies has always been to probably spend more time trying to figure out why we are building stuff and for whom and then, you know, going into the details of building stuff. I love building stuff. I love development, but I just felt more naturally curious towards the why of certain things, right? So that's basically what's driven most of the things or changes that I've made in my life since joining Intel. Yeah, so, so I started with Intel, then I moved to NVIDIA, trying to figure out in graphics processors, what is the kind of workload that comes to work to processors that was not enough. Then I moved to a software company that helps chip developers build chips, right? There I was trying to also be the functional expert and try to tell people about the problems that chip designers felt and then try to change the product that we used to develop on the basis of that, right? And, and, that's, and that was at Mentor Graphics. And that's where I actually uh, realized that, you know, the path that I'm going towards uh, is basically a product manager path. And then I started taking more direct steps uh, that I felt were needed uh, for me to become a product manager. Not saying that those are the only steps or those are the best steps to take, but that's what I was able to understand then. And those are the steps I could take, right? So, yeah. So that's been me, my path. Currently, as I said, uh, I, I work at Uber. Uh, there's not so much I can share on what I do, but it's I'm on the fraud team. Basically, I'm building stuff to help Uber tackle fraud losses that's that's pretty much what i do there and uh, yeah it's it's been a fun journey i guess i'll move on to the uh, topic at hand so this is the topic that we want to cover today which is basically design thinking uh, i would say design thinking is is relevant for any work that we do i believe uh, everybody's trying to build products and services everybody's trying to add value to people customers or whatever, right? And hence design thinking is a concept that's uh, relevant to everyone. But I feel a product manager is very central to building things and, and is actually one of the, is heavily involved in the most initial steps of building things, hence ensuring that uh, design thinking is being implemented for developing is, is extremely important for a product manager to ensure, right? So, so that that's that's definitely one reason why it's even more important for a product manager. But it's not some a skill or a practice or a culture that is relevant only to product managers, right? So, you know, let's. What is product uh, management, right? Uh, sorry, sorry. What is uh, design thinking, right? So, I think design. So, design thinking is basically a framework, a practice, or a culture that helps ensure empathy bias for action and iterative or iteration right while building things right so whatever framework or details that we will go into i think the purpose of all of those is to ensure that these three things are religiously followed or done right so before i go into the details of what is uh, design thinking i think i would rather start with talking about why why is it important i believe that I believe it's worth uh, going into that so that, you know, if you, you understand why we think it's important and why we should go into the details of design thinking. So the first thing is, you know, we, so it's, it basically is important so that we build stuff that can be sold, used, and that's, that adds value to our customers, right? I know off the bat, this sentence or statement looks very basic, vague, and obvious, right? But but what I've come to, and, and you know, I have also felt the same thing that, hey, okay, we all agree with this statement, right? What's the big deal? But I've seen this not being followed or not being done so much now in my life that I think it's, it's important for us to remind ourselves of this every day, right? So uh, let, let me try and give an example, right? That will probably help you understand what I'm talking about. So let's take the context of a B2B software solution, right? What's interesting in B2B software, right? Is that generally the buyers and the users are different people. So if you are a B2B software company, you will have say really smart, charming, uh, sales people, sales sales people who will go show and sell and demo your product to people, to potential customers. The potential customers and these software solutions are really expensive. 
right? And there are big decisions to be taken because once you once you basically buy into a B2B software, you train your employees uh, to use them. You spend a lot of money. So generally you want, it's a big decision to be made, right? So, uh, so the people involved in the buying process from the customer side are buyers, right? They're not necessarily the users. So there'll be VPs and directors and presidents who will be involved in this uh, entire process, right? So the sales cycle includes salespeople and the buyers of the product, right? There's no developer in the process, obviously. And then there is no user as well. So what can happen and what tends to happen sometimes is that there is a sales cycle. You do well in the sales cycle or you don't do well in the sales cycle. You lose or win, right? But you get feedback. You get feedback from your potential customers that, hey, this is what I like, this is what I didn't like, right? And you get the, you continuously get that feedback. Now, the sales teams generally in these companies have a lot of power within the company. They come back to the development so software to their own company. They talk to the engineering and product teams and say, "Hey, this is the feedback we got." And because they have a lot of say and power, that feedback gets heard, right? If that feedback is prioritized, what we end up doing is we end up building or improving our software based on feedback that we got from buyers, not users, right? And that happens a lot. Okay. The problem with that is, yes, you know, this might help us do better in sales cycles the next year. But then once the product is bought, once it is adopted and deployed, uh, sorry, once it's deployed and then adopted, you realize that the that why the customer actually or the, uh, the VPs and, and the buyers, right? Why they spent money on the solution. The reason why they spent money on that solution, that reason is not even manifesting itself because the users who are, are not even using the capabilities, right? That were actually demoed in the sales cycle, right? And uh, so, they, and, and, and when that happens, uh, what these companies or the buyers of the software solutions start doing is they start trying to customize things, they build on top of your software or they uh, get another company, competitor solution to complement your solution. Basically, you're allowing competition to creep in. So you've sold the software, but let's say four years or five years down the line, uh, you uh, there is a license renewal that is due, right? You basically then are almost like competing with another competitor for that customer again. And, and you might lose out because you, you whatever you built and you sold, your uh, users are not really using it. They're not satisfied, right? So you might do well in the sales cycle then, but a few years down the line, you'll fail. Right, so so this is why ensuring that uh, having a balanced approach, right, where you're not only building for the buyers, but you're also building and improving for your actual users is very important, right? Where design thinking comes into this is, I'll give you a very specific example. There was a solution that I was a product manager for. We had this one page, which used to show a table of data, right? In the sales cycles, the sales, I've actually seen that. I was just coincidentally, I was not in sales cycle, right? I was a product manager, but I was in that sales cycle. I could see that the buyers, they were lost in the demo because they were like, you're showing me a big table where a lot of data is changing and you're trying to show me that this data is changing, this data is changing. And they were getting lost because they didn't know what to look for. It was all very busy for them. So they came, so the feedback we got, I also actually got directly was that, you know, your uh, pay, this page, which is an important page, is very busy. I'm getting lost. We need to make this better. We hired US designers. US designers came up with a comfort view where we made the table bigger, the font bigger, spacing even more. And we built a very modern looking view, right? We were really happy with what we did. Everybody was very happy, very impressed. Oh, wow, this looks new. This looks modern, great, right? But then just coincidentally, and we actually did a design thinking session with one of our customers users right we we got them into our office we sat down with them one whole day right and what they told me was us rather that hey i want to look at a lot of data at once i want it to be as small as we see it in excel i don't like this view i'll have to keep clicking next page to see so much more data it was the absolutely opposite fee uh, feedback that we got the reason was we the buyer said one thing which made sense, right? From a demo perspective, this, the demo was very busy, but the actual user didn't like it because the purpose was not being served. So, so basically, fortunately, because of this feedback, 
what we did was we actually built a uh, multiple views we built a comfort view and a uh, power view right a comfort view where which was being used for sales and the power view is what was actually being used by this right so we built that but we would actually have released without that if we didn't do that workshop and trust me this actually happened right so so that's why i think uh, ensuring that we act, uh, follow design thinking right and where our stakeholders or personas that we are building for a design for right are balanced and cover everyone is is extremely important so that's one right one reason why you know design thinking is very important the second one is it's connected to the first one but it's basically to ensure the company and development team is motivated so what happens is you might build some great stuff right but if it doesn't get adopted or if it's not driving business whatever the goals were right for building that capability uh the team gets demotivated the team starts thinking hey why should we build new things if we are not able to get uh, traction on them maybe we are building the wrong stuff uh maybe we are uh, uh maybe we are better off just incrementally improving the existing tools that we are able to sell maybe just for let's just focus on that let's not worry about building something great that's going to solve a or completely solve a new problem right let's not do that because we are not able to drive any uh, adoption so basically that uh, is uh, something right you know that that really demotivates the team i've seen that happen especially in larger companies a team gets demotivated they start looking at other teams uh, what they're doing and how things can work right so 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 it's very important even from a very internal perspective selfish internal perspective right the last one again is also connected uh, this is also to ensure that we are able to retain the trust, uh, trust of our customers and stakeholders right what does that mean well when we build things it's not like we build in absolute silos right uh, people do find out customers will find out because you'll tell them right our stakeholders within the company it could be uh, the sales teams the upper management the the uh, you know whoever uh, the support teams whoever right they basically will know that you've built something and if something gets built and is not used or is not selling then they also know right what happens is uh if they know that the engineering or the product team is developing things which nobody is using right uh what happens is they get really uh disappointed in them why because naturally even if you're doing a very good job right you'll always have a thousand requests from your customers and stakeholders to do you will only be able to prioritize a few you'll only do those right the customers and stakeholders completely understand that right? they are very comfortable with that but if they think that we are prioritizing things that nobody uses in the end right they completely lose faith in uh, us right so we'll build stuff but we won't get the support from the other team for our products to be successful or maybe our customers have lost us and they will eventually go away right so these three reasons are uh, kind of connected but you know i still thought they are all important to be called out separately Right, so yeah, I hope I've been able to drive the uh, home the importance of design thinking. Right, why it is very important for us to uh, focus on this particular thing to ensure that we're building the right stuff. I'll go back to talking about what's design thinking, right, or or the way I understand it. I can talk about how I have what I understand design thinking is and. and how we have been or i have been using it in my work but there could be some subtle differences here or there but i think conceptually we're all saying the same thing right so okay so i think the first step here is empathize right so empathize is basically as the word suggests it's basically you basically step into the shoes of your customer or user right that's what empathizes right so you can't literally do that so you do that basically by shadowing people by interviewing them by asking them questions whatever means are available to you right you do that and the goal here is to be able to understand right uh, what who the user is what they want to do and how they feel right that's basically the purpose of empathize and uh, as i said right you use whatever means you have to do that right to give an example we actually called somebody from our customer took one day out of their life asked them to sit in our office sit with 20 of us and uh, tell us what they would do every day right so it so it could just be that or it could be going on the street and actually talking to your 
prospective users if you're building a new product, right? So there could be different means of doing this, but that's what empathize is, right? The second part is define. I think empathize and define are very close, right? Basically, I think you empathize so that you're able to define uh, something. So what is that define something? Right? Define is basically, you should be able to say that, uh, or articulate, right? What the user wants, right? Or rather what the user wants to do, right? And how they feel. So the answer to the what generally has to be a noun, right? Uh, I want to jump off a building without getting hurt, right? That could, that, that's also a noun, right? Jump off a building, right? It could be anything, right? But uh, so, so that's the want, right? What do you want to do? And how you want to feel, right? So th that helps you understand, right? Uh, what exactly you're trying to solve for. So in the case of that guy who'd come to our office, right? It could be a case of, I want to look at a lot of data so that I can feel comfortable while making decisions. And the comfort is, um, you know, basically because, you know, if you're able to look at more data while making a decision, you'll be more happy. Right? I don't want to go into details of what data and what decision, uh, because I think that would just be talking too much about my product, but otherwise, uh, that's what it is, right? So the want there is to uh, look at more data and the feeling there is comfort, right? So we'll see more examples down below to be able to understand this better, or at least one example. And the third phase is I ideate, right? Ideate is generally a, a challenging uh, phase. At least I felt that because we generally are very uh, self-conscious people, right? But I think the goal here is to ensure that whoever's involved in your process, everybody needs to have an open mind. There needs to be no judgment, which never ideally happens 100%, right? And there needs to be no self-judgment also, right? Whatever idea comes to your mind, just put it out there, right? It could be very simple or it could be way too complex, right? Uh, so everything needs to go on the board, right? And uh, so that that is the brainstorming phase where you know what you're solving for, right? You know you're solving for a person who wants to this and feels this way, right? What do you have to do for that is something that you brainstorm through in the ideate phase, right? <clears throat> so apart from brainstorming, obviously, one has to narrow down, focus again, and try to understand or decide which are the ideal or the better candidates from the ideate phase. But please ensure that that judgment, you have to eventually judge, right? But the judgment doesn't happen. You have to first put everything on the board. And then when, when, when you start removing things from the board, be as brutal as you want, right? But you have to be open in the beginning, right? So in the ideate phase, you pick your ideas or you pick the first idea, right? And then you prototype it, right? So prototyping uh, can be thought of in a lot of ways, right? If you're building software, right? Prototypes could be... Uh, just stick diagrams, block diagrams on a piece of paper, on PPT, whatever, right? And uh, that could be a prototype. And then a second level prototype could be um, uh, wireframes, you know, using tools like uh, Figma, Balsamic, I don't know, InVision, right? And uh, so that's, that's prototyping, where you basically try to build a prototype of a product that's in software, but even if it's, you know, even if we're building a FMCG or a food product, right? A prototype could very well be that uh, you build the food that you've built. You don't really worry about packaging it that well. You could just go on the street and try to feed people the food so that you can get feedback on it, right? So that would be a prototype because in food, how else would you prototype? But that depends on the problem you're solving. If the problem you're solving, if the problem that you identified with your food product was not related to the taste, but it was about packaging, then maybe in the prototype, you actually make the packaging only and you show that in the market, or you take it out in the market or take it out on the street and try to show people right, to get feedback. So that all depends on what problem you're trying to solve. So that's prototype. Uh, and then, uh, then there's a final phase of testing where you basically test your prototype, right? As I said, take it to the field, get feedback from people. This is where you actually get feedback. So it's also in a way kind of closing the loop because you start with empathy where you first talk to your users, potential users, customers, right? And then, then you went back, did your own thing, right? And now you've come back again to the market or to the field and you're trying to get feedback on it. So it kind of closes the loop, 
right? Now, one thing that I've not been talking about is how this is an iterative process, you know? All of these steps can be iterated, right? You could be going back from any step to another step to come back and build again. Because we said, right, there were three things that were important. One was empathy, the other was bias to action, and the third was iteration. So the empathy comes from empathize, define. Uh, bias for action comes from the fact that you are willing to prototype something without building the ideal perfect solution and take it to the market, right? And take it to the market could not be, could be not, doesn't have to be literally, right? You can just take it to the field and just get it tested with people for free. You don't have to make them pay or anything, right? So that's there. And the third is iteration. So how do you ensure iteration? So one of the most typical ways of iteration is, hey, you know, we have a prototype, we got it tested, we got feedback, we work on our prototype, make it better, we got feedback, we come back to the prototype, make it better, right? So let's say in the case of software, you start with a block diagram, you show it to some very close customers, in, let's say in a B2B world, right? You show it to some very close customers who are, who you know are very good with your software, right? You show this block diagram to them and they can then understand what you're thinking about. Uh, they can give you feedback. Then the next time, uh, you take their feedback and then you don't, you make proper wireframes for your software solution, right? And then you uh, show it to a wider audience, including the older guys, right? The, the, the initial team that you spoke to, initial customers, show it to more people, get more feedback in, right? Get that feedback in and then you build, uh, you know, uh, uh, you build the actual software, but not the entire solution, right? So, that's how you basically work. And what this does is with each phase of prototyping, you're increasing the resolution or quality of your prototype, right? Number one. Number two, you're also reducing the risk, right? Because as you keep getting feedback with each step, the risk of failure reduces significantly, right? You can actually plot a graph like that, that, that you know, the risk has actually gone down with each phase. So, uh, yeah, so so that's the value behind prototyping and testing, right? You you get your feedback, you get layers and layers of feedback, and you also reduce your risk. Having said that, right? From test, you can actually maybe just go back to empathize again, right? What what if you understand understood the whole process incorrectly? You went, you took a prototype and took it to the field, and uh, somebody said, "Hey, what problem are you even solving? This is not even important. I don't or we don't even care about." It. So then you have to go back to empathize and, and do the whole process again. And, and we should be okay with doing that, right? So that's there. In this kind of case, in this case, and even in the other cases, right, it's very important for one to have an open mind, right? Our idea is not to sell yet. It's to get feedback. So if there is feedback, we have to take feedback, right? And you'll get hundreds of, I mean, the more feedback you get better. Every feedback is not supposed to have equal weightage. and there could be contradictory feedback as well. So that's where, you know, your logical thinking has to come into place. Uh, what makes more sense? What's more important and stuff like that. What aligns more with your goals? Which kind of customer gave what feedback? That's there. But you have to take all the feedback in. You haven't gone there to sell something to them. And it happens, you know, it's 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 very subtle thing. But if you start trying to sell your product to somebody, hey, this is why I built it. And, you know, no, no, maybe you're not missing, you're missing this or, you're not thinking about this or, oh, is it not you who worries about this in your team and stuff like that, right? This makes the uh, person who's testing this for you, right? Say, be like, okay, fine. I mean, okay, if you're not willing to listen, I'll just be like, ah, good, good job and move on, right? So to ensure you get quality feedback, you have to uh, be open and, and not get defensive. That's that's really important. I see a question. I don't know. Uh, Nija, do, do we want to leave this to the end or do we want to take this up right now? Uh, yes, we do have a formal question answer session, uh, like segment right at the end. But whatever you feel would be appropriate, we can accordingly do that. Yeah. So Abhishek, I, I don't know actually to, to, to answer your question. Right. The question is: Is this design thinking process a part of Six Sigma methodology? I don't know. I don't know what Six Sigma is, so I I can't comment. But I'm sure there'll be borrowed concepts. I'm 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 fairly certain. So yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to go into further details of, let me do a quick time check. Okay, yeah. I, I, I don't want to do, go into further details of the process, all right? Uh, maybe what we can do is uh, take an example, right? That we have here of, you know, where we've seen this work. Before we go there, right? I just wanted to call this out. I think the whole goal of the entire process is to ensure that we achieve what you see here in the intersection. Feasibility, viability, and uh, 
desirability, right? I think if we are able to follow design thinking, the process that we spoke about above or something similar to that, uh, I feel that we can actually achieve this intersection because desirability you've ensured because you know you you start with empathizing and then you close the loop with tests, right? So you know that, hey, this works or this is important to the user or the user sees value in this. Uh, I think feasibility is something because there is bias for action and you're thinking through the product or the solution that they're trying to build, you automatically go into the weeds of the details, right? Where you're able to figure out that, hey, okay, these are the feasibility challenges. This could be this expensive a project or this could be this expensive a project or not a very expensive project at all, right? For that matter. So because that's why I think bias for action is important because that helps us or makes us think about uh, or at least think through the solution and maybe even articulate those things, which helps us understand feasibility and even size the solution for us, right? On how much time this thing could take. So, so th th that's addressed, desirability is addressed and viability also is addressed because we know that it will work because we've gone through the due diligence of understanding our users, talking to them, getting their feedback, right? So I think if, if this process is followed, we do hit this uh, design thinking sweet spot or intersection that we're seeing in the slide. So yeah, I was talking about uh, looking at an example, right? So uh, there is a classic uh, Airbnb story, right? Which uh, really addresses or or uh, drives home some of the points that we were talking about earlier. So let me just go through that a little bit. So basically uh, the two founders, right? I think it was a phase, I don't know exactly the time when this happened, but there was a phase where I think uh, they were uh, not really seeing too much growth on Airbnb. They probably had uh, their uh, early adopters uh, come in, use these things, right? But they were not able to move to the next step where they were able to move on to the next uh, type of users, right? That they might get. And uh, they had actually gone, uh, they worked, they looked at their software, they looked at data on what's happening, what's not working well, and they were not able to understand, right? Uh, why they were not able to see any growth at all. I mean, I'm guessing, right? Being smart people, they would have looked at all the things that they had access to from a data tracking user's point of view to be able to understand what was missing, right? So uh, they weren't sure. Uh, so I don't know if it was a coincidence or not, but I think they were in New York or something. And because the company was small then, and even their uh, hosts on Airbnb was a very small number, I believe they only had like what 40 odd uh, apartments or whatever hosts listed uh, for New York City, right? Seems like an awfully small number, but that's the story that I've heard, right? So they had 40. So it was kind of easy also, right? To go through all the listings. And there's 40 listings, right? You care about this. So you can very easily go through each of these. So uh, that, uh, so they went through all the listings. And what they figured out was that um, the quality of the photographs on um, uh, the portal, right? Was very bad of the apartments. Now, yeah, the problem of the system was that, you know, hey, uh, these are not photos that they were putting, right? These are basically the hosts that were putting themselves. So they were not doing a very good job of clicking the photos. Also, you know, uh, I think there was some, there's some story and some controversy also, if I'm not wrong, around uh, getting listings from Craigslist. So apparently Craigslist had this limit on the size of photos. So because of that, the photos were really, really small and poor in quality, right? And Craigslist is such an old platform, right? So uh, because of these reasons, they actually said that there were actually some photographs which were in the night. So you couldn't even see properly the kind of location. So, you know, Airbnb was still a very small brand. These are not professional hotels. You're going to go stay, stay in, right? So as it is, your trust on, uh, on living there is going to be low. On top of that, the photos are also not very nice, right? So it was not really going to go well. So this is something that, uh, this was the problem. Now, this is something that they could not capture anywhere uh, from by looking at data, right? Uh, they actually were able to figure this out when they themselves tried to book a, a hotel or something or a, or a, or an accommodation or an Airbnb in on Airbnb, right? They actually themselves saw. So basically when they stepped into the shoes of their users, right? Uh, they basically saw that um, the photos are so bad that I myself will never want to live here, 
right so why will i why will i take this up right so uh, this was something that uh, they figured and the only way they were able to figure this out was not through any data or some tracking capability on the app or whatever it was basically by just going and doing the work for themselves so that was one right uh, then the other thing was uh, how did they so again one more thing right there were only 40 listings so they were able to do this look at all of them right not really a scalable way of doing things right or uh, not really a scalable way of gauging the quality of your photos right if you had a million photos right what would you do you try to build some kind of a model which will help you rate the photos well and blah 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 stuff like that but sometimes uh, the situation and the resource availability warrants for taking up non scalable options also right uh, yes when things are going well and when the framework is in place and when there's enough data then you would want to build like a machine learning model like that but in this context that made no sense but but still you do that right you don't think that hey there's only for i'll go look at them hey that's fine i'll go look at them right now but what will we do when we scale up well we'll worry about that later right for now let's do the simple thing let's go look at these 40 things right so so they they used a non scalable approach to understanding the problem right then after that how did they solve it well they took a camera i think they rented some camera some standing whatever equipment is required and they went around new york uh, and i'm guessing they must be all centered in the same location they took they took up all of their weekends and they actually professed either they or somebody clicked the photographs in a much better way and those photographs were actually used on the platform and when they did that uh obviously they saw results right when they when they changed the photographs there uh, they were able to uh, see those results and and i think the story is almost immediately the revenue doubled which was not much anyway at that point of time so it's not like they became millionaires immediately but that's the entire story right that um uh, you know sometimes so so for me the key takeaways from this story right is that you had they had to step into the users uh, boots they had to uh, uh look for solutions that were probably not very scalable they did something very uh, i don't know uh, non sophisticated right to to understand the problem there is something non unsophisticated rather to to uh, solve the problem right but uh, it showed it gave them results if they would have sat down to build more complex solutions to solve these problems and stuff like that then that would have taken a lot of time and investment which they probably would have not had maybe they would have not we wouldn't have had an airbnb right so so sometimes these small things help us because and and it was bias for action that worked right they said okay let's do this ourselves let's try to solve this problem ourselves and see how the response is because the scale is small right so you can always create your small scale also in a bigger setup but yeah so that for me this is the key take away from this story right uh, that you step into the shoes understand the problem when you become the user yourself and then you solve it in small ways and uh, test to understand what the results were right and and you take it from there i give you both one example that we have to help us you know go through the entire process i know the format of this uh, session is not going to allow for collaboration but you know doing this in a slightly different setup would help us uh, really go through this exercise but i just want to take to take you through an example right so your your company hedigree sells healthy food items to teenagers as per recent data you received the teenage girls have been using the product actively but not the boys how do you plan to solve this right any of you have any ideas if you could use chat and share with me on what's the first thought that's come into your mind right when you when you listen to this it could be why this is happening what we should do next any any thoughts all right i guess not uh mhm mm all right yeah so i i think uh, yeah i think uh, basically what 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 i'm hearing from you are basically theories on what this might be happening and maybe it's my fault i led you into giving that kind of a response but i think the first thing we need to do is uh, empathize right so I, i believe what we'll have to do first is go talk to the 
go talk to uh, the 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 teenage boys in context right some of them to understand what the problem is right because if you look at the responses that we are getting right all of them make sense right uh, but it's important for us to understand which are maybe there are not there's no one good answer maybe there are two or three problems right but because the problems can be so varied the only the best way for us to get that information is to understand it from the people right whom we are solving this for so uh, i guess uh, that's what i think next time is talking about research the users need right gain real uh, insights into the users need now uh, let me just go back to the chat if i can to understand right i think some of them are talking about problems i think some people are also giving solutions right but i think some people are talking about how advertisement could be folks focused on girls etc etc right they don't like the name of the product and stuff like that right i think what is important is we need to go and talk to the user on hey this is about healthy food right so what do you think about it right let them tell us what what they think right maybe somebody will come and say hey i am i don't really care about healthy food at all right that could be one so maybe we need to do something else to make it attractive right for for them maybe somebody could be like i am a fit teenage boy i am not a middle aged person i don't care about these things i am healthy maybe if you maybe i need to maybe i am more interested in things which will help me grow tall or build a body or whatever right maybe it could be that so it so basically maybe they can say hey i want to eat something that helps me build my body so that i can feel confident or so that i can feel you know confident while talking to girls right it could be anything right so so that's what we need to go and talk to our audience which is our customers right and understand we'll have to be that open minded in the way we the question in the in the questions that we ask and stuff right so so that we can hear these kind of things right so that's important for us to get right so we said needs and feelings right and the feelings are the real insight there what do they want to feel right so so that's what we want to get, capture from here so how to these boys do primary secondary research observe what they eat and what they don't eat and why right that's the shadowing bit that we covered earlier that we have to shadow them i mean let's not stalk them but let's find good ways of shadowing right so yeah i think so this is an important part after that as we said define uh, what what their problem is so these are two examples right we need to increase our food product market share among young teen, young teenage boys by 5% right i think we should just have a big cross around this line because this is not really uh, this is nothing to do with empathizing this is not to be defined this is just empathizing with us right as as the company wants to make money so this is not great i think the second one teenage boys need to eat nutritious food in, in order to thrive be healthy and grow and slightly better but this answer is also like maybe this is something my mom wrote for me you know when i when i was a teenager now yeah, my mom might buy something uh, go to the mall and buy something thinking this thing but she'll buy it once and i'll never eat it and then she'll not come and buy again so i think what we need is that for we need a teenage boy to tell us right that hey i need to eat nutritious food that helps me grow muscle and makes me feel confident right maybe maybe that's what it is or it could be you know i want to eat nutritious food but i don't want to carry it in a separate bag because i go to school just like that with just a small bag or something like that, right it could be anything it could be as trivial as that right and um, so yeah so so the, those are the kind of things we want to know right so that would be the ideal kind of answer then the next phase is ideate let's come up with you know how how can we encourage teenagers boy to perform an action that benefits them also and also involves our company's food related product or service and stuff like that right so um, uh, and then there's one about collaboration with somebody right so we need to first understand what they want to feel if they want to feel athletic and stuff then maybe you know we put uh, uh, virat kohli as the person right or or if they want to feel i don't know good looking or something i don't know right then maybe it could be the person who we think is good looking right so not nawazuddin siddiqui i'm guessing but anyway so i think all of this will depend on what we get in the defined phase right what is actually that they want to feel and what is it that they want to do decides our the ideas in ideate right after that you know we prototype uh because this is health food right mm, as you can see here product variation for muscle building for height growth strength and power based marketing so when you're prototyping it could just be that hey either you in all these cases right packaging will play an important role because you package to 
tell the user what they're getting from this, right? Uh, especially as teenagers, I don't really expect them to go through the nutritional contents of the package. So Mark, so maybe when you do your prototyping and testing in the field, you really try to put some attention and details into the packaging, right? Put some thought into that. So, or it could just be a case of, you know, buy them, give them something free with that and uh, uh, they'll buy it, right? I think that, that that's the prototyping phase. And then again, you, as you said, yeah, after the prototype, you take it to test and you understand how they're liking it, if it's really addressing their concerns or not. And then you go back to the table and you try to improve it again better, see what questions they ask, despite seeing the packet, what all did they ask you again? And you go back and change it in your prototype and move on forward from there. And so that is something, uh, that's the entire process on, on how this would work. Obviously, there's a lot of work that goes into it, but yeah, in a nutshell, that's how it is. Just one last slide before we move on. These are just some examples of things that, you know, you can do as an exercise, even by yourself. Design, I think this is one great problem statements. Design a feature for Make My Trip, allowing a group of friends to plan, book their mutual vacation. That would help. Design a product that helps drivers in a crowded city find the nearest available parking space. Design a product helping kids in India quit PUBG, right? So I would say these are things that you can actually go home and do this by yourself. But one thing I will say is that do it in a group. Do it with somebody, right? Don't just go on your own train and, and, and think of things. Uh, do it with people so that they ask, so they can be your people that you empathize with. And they can also be some people, you know, who validate your thoughts, something that you can test with, somebody that you can test with and stuff like that. So it's important to do this as a group. Don't do this by yourself, but I think these are great home exercises for you to go and do. All right, uh, I'm done. Uh, I think we've got 13 minutes left. Uh, so do we want do we want to spend a few minutes on Q&A? Sure, definitely. I can facilitate that. I can moderate that for you. Uh, I'll address all the questions that we've got. Um, and before that, very, very quickly, we'd also like to uh, walk you through the placement focused product management bootcamp that we are running. Um, and of course, I think this really well delineated uh, webinar uh, that was conducted by Rajay Karoja, sir. So I hope you've got a cake, uh, a, a slice of the cake as to how essentially uh, dis design thinking is going to be facilitated. What is the uh, entire mindset that uh, product managers need to have. I'm sure uh, you've got a brief idea, everybody. So uh, we're going to be launching very soon. This is rather one of the first uh, webinars where we've already started disclosing that uh, we're launching this uh, placement-focused product management bootcamp. And we've already started admissions from today onwards for this program. It's going to be 200 hour long program. Um, additionally, before we uh, just quickly move on to the question and answers, uh, very quickly, I'll, I'll walk you through in the next 30 seconds and then it'll be over to Sir with all the questions. So please uh, feel free to generously populate the question answers uh, session um, section with the questions that you're having or put your questions in the chat box. We'll, we'll direct them to Sir and we'll try to answer all those questions. Uh, so this is going to be a program uh, like, it, uh, like I categorically mentioned. It's a very placement uh, focused program, uh, product manager uh, bootcamp sessions that we'll be running. It's going to be spanning over over four months, 200 hours of training that you'll be getting. And a lot of stress would actually be to make sure that you're having a personalized portfolio developed. Uh, so I really loved how Sir said that, you know, practice these problem statements in a group. So these kind of cases you're going to be looking at, there'll be personalized portfolio development, which you can show to the recruiters as to what is a concrete, tangible thing that you've created during your entire journey throughout the course of the program. Uh, additionally, besides personalized portfolios, there's also like a proper mentorship that you'll be getting getting uh, a proper placement support to make sure that you are you're becoming very industry ready when it comes to uh, product managers or roles in product management uh, be it startups be it corporates that's going to be completely up to you which you'll be getting entire support um, throughout your journey uh, in this product management bootcamp that we'll be organizing so over to you i'll be directing a few questions to you so we've got a few questions on the chat box as well i think you have already uh, addressed abhishek's question that the design thinking process uh, whether it's part of six six uh, sigma methodology i think you've already answered that would you like to take that up again not really Nija. I, I saw some comments that i think answered that question i okay. don't know much about six sigma to be honest with you uh -huh. so yeah 
Uh, yeah. that, that makes perfect sense. There's another uh, question in the chat box. Everyone, please feel free. Any questions that you have with regards to uh, anything which is related to product management, uh, anything related to career opportunities in this domain, or if you're curious to know what Sir is essentially doing, please feel free to populate the chat box. Okay, we've got Ayush Mittal's question. Uh, what skills should he focus on if he wants to become a product manager? I think product management is... Uh... So, uh, sorry, I think uh, Nija, there's, a, there's another question that Chetan has asked. I think that one will get answered quickly and then I can move on to Ayush's question. Definitely, definitely. And Chetan's question is, is this an online or an offline program that we're running? So this is going to be a hybrid uh, program. Uh, so please feel free to add because I'm sure, like I said, Sir is going to be one of the masters uh, for this entire program. Would you like to uh, highlight the key features of the program, even though we'll start letting students know about it very soon? Uh, but would you like to take that up? I think uh, Ayush, do, do you want to uh, jump in? Yeah, it is. Uh, that's right, Ayush. Uh, that's absolutely right. It's going to be hybrid. Uh, but Chetan, let me just tell you, all the all the master camps that are being run, we are trying to give you a campus-like feel. So it's not going to be you sitting in silos and uh, just consuming whatever online material is provided to you. It'll be constructive or uh, support that you'll be getting, even the placement support that will be given. You can come to the campus. So there's a master's union campus here uh, in Delhi NCR, just uh, in DLF Cyber Park, opposite Ambient Small the minute you enter Delhi Gurgaon border. Um, additionally, if you're not in Delhi NCR, uh, there are also satellite campuses that we run. So one of the most important aspect of master camps is that we really want to simulate a campus sort of an environment, a campus-like environment, so that you can collaborate and learn better. And like Sir said that, you know, for all these problem statements as product managers, uh, you can't really work in silos. You will have to collaborate. And the entire program has also been engineered and structured in such a way that it tries to give you a lot of opportunities opportunities, a lot of real world examples so that you can simulate the real world uh, conditions. So yes, of course, it will be a hybrid program. Uh, but yes, uh, you, you will be getting access to the Masters Union campus as well. Ayush, please feel free if you want to jump in and add anything. Yes, Chetan. So we don't really call it campus placements per se. Uh, there's a well-dedicated career placement team which sits over here at Masters Union, which will be giving you absolute support. And this is not like uh, campus placements are more like, you know, towards the end of your academic career, you start with the campus placements. There's nothing of this sort. The minute you enter the program, uh, uh, say within a fortnight's time, you will start getting that support. Your resumes will start getting sanitized. There'll be personal branding. Uh, there'll be sanitization of your LinkedIn profile. Uh, there'll be proper structured session. So we will be coming up very soon. And I highly recommend uh, that you watch the webinar, Chetan, wherein we'll try to elaborate as much as possible and uh, address all these uh, frequently asked questions with regards to the program that we are offering. Uh, but today, we really wanted to make sure that, you know, Sir's uh, teaching methodology, you're, you're acquainted with or an interest in product management, or, you know, understanding what is product management, what is design thinking, what are the various steps, how customer experience really needs to be given priority and case studies like the Airbnb case study that was given over here. Uh, so just making sure that, you know, these examples are up out there in front of us and uh, just trying to build that curiosity in you because this is going to be a really important um, upcoming career opportunity where a lot of product managers are actually required in the work world space. So now would you like to first answer uh, the question that was asked by Ayush or do you want to... Uh, no, no, I, I think I think there's another question uh, that Dignesh asked on the Q&A part. Is this program targeted to professionals already experienced in PM more than freshers or students? I think Anija might have an answer here, but I just want to add one thing. So Vignesh, in my experience, right, I mean, this is definitely going to be extremely helpful for any students or freshers. Absolutely. Especially because, you know, I think we all, as, as we are starting our careers, we hear these slightly vague subjective concepts and we're not able to take them seriously because we're not we are trained to think in a certain way on, hey, what skills, hard skills do we need, right? But as we move on, we realize, and to be honest, in your interviews, right, I, I think these things, is this is what we are testing for, especially in a product management role. Having said that, even for experienced people, I'll tell you what, I have done these sessions where the company is paid for me, where we are talking about the same things, because these are so easy to forget, Right. Uh, I mean, you just get so busy with your own context and your own set of problems that you have that you forget taking a step back. So these, this is valuable. I would say, I don't know if this program is structured for them, but re-emphasizing these kind of concepts are relevant even for people who have experience in PM, right? Uh, Nija, do you want to add to that or are we good to go? 
Absolutely, absolutely. So you've aptly uh, said it. It, it. it is for both working professionals who want to probably take their career to the next level with the support of the masters who will be coming in and uh, making sure that you know you get that additional support. Uh, so certainly it's targeted to both freshers as well as to experienced students. Uh, would you, okay, right. So there's another uh, question that has been posed by Aditya. So Aditya asking work, working at uber didn't you ever uh, feel that the company was lacking a lot in payment methods variety uh, for a lot of years so he he's just talking about this question yeah. let me take that question up yeah so i think uh, aditya i'll focus on the last line of your question how to understand which problems make sense or not the rest of it is uber specific i don't want to go into details but generally right uh, one attitude that is very important for us to have is the question here is how to understand which problems make sense or not, right? Uh, the answer is all problems make sense, right? I think the question is more about uh, how do you prioritize or which are the more important problems to solve? And uh, generally, the it's a classic prioritization case. Uh, it's always is a numbers game, but it all depends on your goals, right? If your goals, if you're a stable company, generally your goals, then your goals will be profitability or growth, right? In that case, uh, you would be focusing on that, right? Uh, but sometimes it could just be like, it's okay if this is a risky thing, even if we, you know, we might lose some money, but growth is our goal. So you'll prioritize accordingly. So it completely always aligns with the goals, immediate goals of a company. And that's how you pri prioritize. So there are several prioritization techniques, but uh, generally I would say empathize with the product manager also. If you're looking at a product, and you don't see something, there's probably a good reason why. Because they, they had limited resources, they took a decision to do something else instead. And the reason for that could be alignment with the goals of the company. I think there was a question on the fee. Correct. Sorry, uh, so I'll, I'll quickly answer that, Janel. Uh, so the fees is 4,20,000 plus GST. Uh, coming on uh, to size question in the question answer box, during the ideation step, we may have multiple design ideas. How can we analyze uh, to decide which design is better to implement for prototyping and take it to the next level, basically? And any particular methodology or technique uh, that we need to follow? Uh, or is it that product management is dependent on intuition? So I think one of the things is, uh, one of the things here is bias to action, bias for action, right? So whatever you can get out soon is the way to go, right? Uh, this, this question would be answered better with an example, but I don't think I have a time for that or a bunch of examples. But it's basically whatever lets you go to the uh, go to the field as soon as possible. Last bit is a very useful line. Product manager intuition. I think that's a concept that doesn't exist because there's no in, you build your intuition based on the data that you're able to collect. That data doesn't have to be numbers. It basically has to be it. It could be numbers. It could be just by listening to people, right? So the intuition is manufactured, and that ma needs to be manufactured in the right way. So it's all about what your so it's always a calculation between, hey, how well is this solving the problems that we are addressing and how much time will it take to build? Because if the prototype is taking really long to build, then, then we, we're not going anywhere. So on in the ideation phase, that's a very important consideration. Right. There's another question uh, that Chetan is asking uh, that do we need an undergrad degree for sitting for the program? This is a placement focused program, uh, Chetan. So ideally it's recommended because a lot of um, organizers, uh, organizations will have that as an at least a, uh, an entry level criteria that you should be a graduate. Uh, but sir, would you like to take that up as well? That graduation is uh, ideally recommended. However, uh, Chetan, if you're, if you're a sophomore, more, if you're in your second year, you're about to enter the job market very soon, then then definitely you can apply for the program. All right, so I think the questions, anyone else has any questions? So Aditya, right. the uh, second question on intercity rights, right? I'm not going to answer that. Right, right. I mean, I, I, I can't be answering that, yeah. All right. On this call, yeah. Fair enough. I I, I think you've answered all, all the questions exhaustively via your slide. Uh, Chetan, I think uh, what I would recommend is maybe uh, someone from our team can, a counselor can coach you up if you're a dropout uh, to figure out what is the candidature like and then they can accordingly suggest. So I recommend that, you know, you definitely reach out to us. Uh, sure, I'll, I'll just, uh, Chetan, I'll, I'll, I'll just be putting it across. Uh, just one. Master camp, eight questions. Right. Thank you.
So Jaitan, please feel free to write to us and I think we can accordingly suggest and help you out with that. But ideally, graduation should be there or you should be entering the job market. All right. Thank you so much, uh, sir. I generally uh, got a lot of idea when it comes to dis design thinking as well as uh, product management. So thanks so much for taking out the time. And thank you, everybody, for joining in. Should you have any doubts, please feel free to write to us. Uh, we'd be more than happy to address those doubts and like I said this is one of the first formal introduction that we are telling that you know we've, we're just coming up with the program the placement focus program in product management so if you have so, any uh, concerns yeah sure Nisha I just want to answer the last question right that Vignesh is I think it's important so Vignesh I think the role of a product manager varies with seniority with context so it overlaps with a lot of roles you have to wear a lot of different hats and every product manager and every company treat the role of a product manager very, very different. So there is no perfect answer for it. But one thing that I can say is as a product manager, you are looking at the fact that you are responsible for ensuring that a group of developers, analysts, et cetera, et cetera, are working towards building something that aligns with the company's goal and will bring success, right? However, the company defines success. So you decide or rather you're the owner of the decision on what needs to be built, right? And your idea is to make a case for it for the development teams, make a case for it for the upper management team so that they can get funding and make a case for it eventually to the customer so that they uh, start using it. So that's what it is. You might do some data analysis work. You might even do some sales work, right? You might do some marketing work. You might do some engineering IC work where you look at the architecture, right? Of or have comments. So it could all depend on the context. So yeah, several hats that you'll be wearing. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for joining us. Mm -hmm.